Good evening. Yeah. Well, um, this is a real thrill. I just want to um, welcome you all to this Oven Lecture Series uh, featuring Jane Pauley, and I'm happy to report that I'd always hoped that Jane Pauley would be very, very nice, and it turns out she really is. So. Uh, um, this lecture series, the Oven Lecture Series, uh, was uh, created at DePauw from a gift from uh, Timothy and Sharon Ubben, both 1958 graduates of DePauw. And through their generosity, DePauw has been able to welcome to our campus Tony Blair, Michael Gorbachev, Malin Albright, and now Jane Pauley. Uh, today also marks the centennial celebration of the Society of Professional Journalists at DePauw University. Over 100 years ago in this very building, 10 DePaul University student journalists formed Sigma Delta Chi, an honorary journalist society. Within a few years, Sigma Delta Chi had spread to a dozen other campuses and eventually became a national institution and an influential voice in American journalism. We are very proud that some of the nation's most illustrious and principled journalists began their life work here at DePaul. In fact, when President John F. Kennedy hosted a White House luncheon in January 1962 for 12 outstanding journalists, the guests included three DePaul graduates, Bernard Barney Kilgore, 29, of the Wall Street Journal, Jean Pulliam, class of 10, of the Indianapolis Star, and Don Maxwell, class of 21, of the Chicago Tribune, all of whom were also um, DePaul trustees. Now the torch has been ca carried on by the likes of Bob Steele, Pulliam Distinguished Visiting Professor of Journalism at DePauw, James B. Stewart, currently editor-at-large of Smart Money, reporter-at-large at The New Yorker, and Bloomberg Professor of Business and Economic Journalism at Columbia University. And of course, the late Jack McQuethy, who prior to his tragic death last year was ABC News Chief National Security Correspondent. So thank you for being with us here tonight to celebrate the founding of the, uh, the Society of Professional Journalists. Introducing our featured speaker today will be Dr. Susan Hahn, James Wycombe Riley Distinguished Professor, Professor of English, Director of the Women's Studies Program, and Director of the Writing Center. Dr. Hahn earned her PhD from the University of California and came to DePauw in 1996. Her area of interest is in the history of the novel, and her dissertation focused on Thomas Hardy. She's presented papers on feminist issues for the last 11 years and is currently working on research on the writings of Willa Cather and Edith Wharton. So, Professor Hahn. Thank you. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Jane Pauley and to highlight a few of her outstanding achievements in journalism. I had been wondering how to address her, but I learned at dinner that Dr. Polly received an honorary degree at DePauw, here at DePauw in 1978, so my problem is solved. <laughs> and for hereafter, she'll be Dr. Polly. Um, since Dr. Polly was born and raised in Indiana, I guess we can officially say, welcome home. <laughs> Uh, as many of you know, she began her very distinguished career here in Indianapolis in 1972 as a reporter and anchor for CBS affiliate Wish TV. And we have the very man that hired her sitting here who told some wonderful stories at dinner about his uh, prescience in recognizing <laughs> her talent. Um, within a few short years, she was the first female evening news anchor at NBC WMAQ in Chicago. She moved on to prestigious positions as host of NBC's Today Show for 13 years, weekend anchor of the NBC Nightly News, and host of Dateline Real Life with Jane Polly and The Jane Polly Show. She is also now a best-selling author, and I can highly recommend her 2004 memoir, Sky Riding, uh, which I had the privilege of reading a couple of summers ago. And if you want to know more about her career, um, definitely read it. Dr. Polly has been recognized by her peers for her excellent work with numerous significant awards. The Edward R. Murrow Award for Outstanding Achievement, the Radio and Television News Directors Association's Paul White Award for Lifetime Contribution to Electronic Journalism, the Gracie Allen Award for Outstanding Achievement by an Individual from, 
an American Women in Radio and Television, and the first International Matrix Award from the Association for Women in Communication. Jane Polly's career is outstanding by any professional measure. For many of us, though, we have been especially inspired by her as a role model, by her roles as a model, a mentor, and a groundbreaker for women entering careers traditionally dominated by men. From my point of view, her very visible presence in so many forums has been especially inspiring to women. She is among those who has made it easier for all women to be recognized as professionals, and her work has contributed to the many advances women have made as we pursue our dreams in our chosen careers. Please join me in thanking and welcoming Jane Polly. Thank you. I picked the most beautiful weekend of the year, I'm sure, uh, to come on the way up. I saw this big lawn mowing uh, Friday and, you know, couples sitting on their front porch rocking and the flowers in, in Little Five, which I, I think is they're having more fun out there than they're having here. Um, uh, it, it's an interesting crowd. I know there are a, a, a lot of uh, SPJ journalists here, um, uh, maybe people just uh, from the Greencastle area. I'm glad you came. Wouldn't be surprised if they're undergraduates, are recognized by your attire, and, um, and, and, and maybe a, a Cap Kappa Gamma or two who, with whom, yes. I thought the attractive girls in the corner might, uh, yeah. And a lot of, um, of, of old friends from uh, my years with SPJ and uh, uh, journalism in Indianapolis. And I know a lot of people here would, would, would join me in uh, uh, acknowledging Leanne Harper, whose uh, uh, husband, Terry Harper, everybody uh, with SPJ uh, has the fondest thoughts of. Uh, Terry's having a kind of a tough time now, the executive director of SPJ, and our, our thoughts are with you, Leanne. We're you are now. Um, Susan, uh, I thank you for a um, very generous introduction. If we sat together at dinner, we, we, we would have talked more. I have Willa Cather and um, Edith Wharton by my bedside now. Um, I, I, your introduction was a, a, a little long on awards that I, I have won and or been given and have forgotten about it. It, it sounds like I've had a really interesting career. and. <laughs> You know, one of those careers that spans the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond, like a classic radio format. <laughs> um, they still have those, yeah. Um, but I do appreciate the perspective um, that you took, Susan. And uh, um, in particular, I mean by keeping things in perspective. The 100th anniversary of SPJ, it would, would seem all the more important to keep things in perspective. I think I had a kindred spirit in a man I never met, though I recycled his stuff a lot uh, on the new news in Indianapolis at Channel 8. Um, uh, he might not have felt a kindred uh, spirit to me, and uh, in fact, if he were still alive, might be wondering wh what the heck I'm talking about. You remember, uh, many of you, Charles Kuralt and his wonderful On the Road series uh, for CBS. Uh, I mean, he was one of the greatest, and yet he gave a speech at RTNDA. Where I was looking up that thing he said about Anchorman hair, uh, which I won't go into now, but it was really funny. But he said, it is wonderful to watch a great news organization like the one I work for gear up to cover a big story. And I have watched and watched. <laughs> yeah. I, too, worked for a great uh, news organization and we worked with uh, some of the greatest, Tom Brokaw, uh, Tim Russert. I was in the, the studio when uh, Tim Russert first used his famous whiteboard. I was watching. Um, I was not a pioneer in broadcasting like Barbara Walters and, and her generation, though Barbara has said that of all of us, 
I don't know who she meant by all of us, but she said, of all of us, I'm Jane Pauley. I'm the only one who really had it all, uh, which I think is pretty ironic because in my day I was a big having it all debunker, uh, unless uh, having it all meant guilt, burnout, and stress. <laughs> in the uh, 80s when you know, my having it all uh, decade was at its, its peak, there was a, a, a baby boom on morning television. Uh, Good Morning America and the Today Show had dueling pregnancies. Uh, this was kind of a novelty at the time because before our generation, you literally wouldn't say pregnant woman on television, much less be one. This is amazing. When Barbara Walters took a day off from the Today Show to adopt a baby girl, she didn't even tell her colleagues where she was going. Well, Joan London started it on Good Morning America. Uh, she was pregnant first, but I trumped her with twins. <laughs> I had a boss at the time, a, a real character, a guy named Steve Friedman, and a colleague that many of you will uh, remember very well named Willard Scott. Uh, it was a little like working with Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> now, it's kind of comical uh, being pregnant with twins, but I was trying to keep kind of a low profile. <laughs> Well, the Steve Friedman once boasted to the press that uh, we have twice as many babies coming as any other morning show. <laughs> even though my twins never appeared on camera, uh, not even in photographs, but out of sight was not out of mind. Uh, last fall, I, I came back to Indiana doing some uh, uh, campaigning on the other side of the rope, so to speak, and, and my daughter, Ricky, was accustomed to being asked by people, are you one of the twins? Um, my daughter, Ricky, to be perfectly honest, was, was not that grateful that my husband, Gary, and I uh, chose to keep our public lives and our, our private lives uh, pretty separate. When she was a teenager, she called me a bad celebrity. <laughs> but some people, I think, must have drawn the opposite conclusion because without any evidence, uh, assumed I was a good mother, as if uh, keeping my family off stage implied that I had a real life at home. Um, there's no time now uh, to tell you how I later shamelessly exploited my children on the Jane Pauley show, but by then they were consenting adults and I was desperate. <laughs> but a generation ago, women appearing on TV every day, uh, whether on the morning shows or on local anchor desks, working side by side with men in a professional setting, we reflected uh, changes, dramatic changes going on in society. We all covered the first woman this or that. I personally covered uh, the first woman on a presidential uh, nominating ticket, the first woman astronaut, the first woman driver at the Indy 500, the first woman jockey, probably the first woman bank robber. We, we did a long list of firsts. Um, I, by the way, I think I was the first baby boomer on a network anchor desk, though uh, that was not particularly remarked on at the time, and now, where are the baby boomers on the anchor desks? But more than reflecting change at that time, I think that all of us, women anchors, reporters, mostly young women on television, uh, probably accelerated uh, the change that was going on. Uh, we made working, and even working while pregnant, look normal, and probably helped it to become the norm, and all while doing what just came naturally. And for that, I'm celebrated. Uh, my husband, Gary, and I uh, share uh, the distinction of having honorary degrees from DePaul, mine in 1978, as Susan mentioned. Gary's in 1983, when I was pregnant. I, it, I, I, maybe I didn't know yet. I was very new pregnancy and still secret. Uh, the twins uh, were born seven months after that commencement in 1983, and giving birth was not as painful as giving these children names uh, that their parents could agree on. Uh, so my twin babies for uh, several days at least uh, were known as Twin A and Twin B. 
And according to a, 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 a wire service report, fairly premature, uh, I saw this recently. We had decided on Richard for the boy, and the girl would be called Twinba. <laughs> Twin B, possibly. Now, Twinba was tempting, yes, but ultimately we went with Rachel, and she's been called Ricky. Uh, more or less ever since. And her brother, however, was named Richard after my father, uh, though he, all his life he has gone by his middle name, Ross. Uh, though sometimes we call him Rossy, or every now and then, Rosser. Now, I never knew where Ross, the name, came from. There's no family history. But a week ago, uh, I Googled myself and <laughs> looking, okay, the DePauw thing. And I realized that the DePauw president who conferred both of our degrees was named Richard Rosser. <laughs> Strange but true. <laughs> I have never come to Greencastle, and I have been here many times, on anything but an auspicious occasion. I am fairly confident, uh, though as my remarks will later undermine any confidence you may have in my recollection, but I'm fairly confident that my first assignment was here at DePauw to cover the opening of the brand new Science Center, which, by the way, I thought was holding up pretty well in middle age, though I hear it's had some work done. <laughs> <laughs> my first interview as a rookie reporter, nonetheless, was with, here in Greencastle, a Nobel laureate. I will save that story for tomorrow. Not a long one, but it's a funny one. I'm being inducted tomorrow in the Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame. In my case, the Hall of Fate, I feel, would be equally apt. A word of caution here. Whenever I, in the past, have implied that luck or timing had anything to do with the success I have enjoyed. The gentleman here in the front row, Lee Giles, the news director who hired me, he's a mild-mannered looking man, but his blood pressure rises. In fact, it was at an SPJ event that I first observed a surprising phenomenon. He even used publicly at a microphone language I had never heard from Lee Giles before. He said, give me a break, which was pretty harsh coming from Lee Giles. So keep an eye on him, because Lee, I'm heading that direction again. Consider my background in journalism. It was a case of like father, like daughter. We both delivered the news. Uh, my father had a paper route. <laughs> he grew up in Morristown, Indiana. He was a hardworking kid, also mowed lawns. He was smart, and he won a scholarship to DePauw though he didn't come. It was during the Depression. He had heavy family responsibilities for a teenager. Felt that he had to, quote, get productive right away. Well, I guess his bad luck was my good fortune because he got a job at an office where he met my mother. It was the Wilson Milk Company. They sold evaporated milk. Mom was the accounts payable department. She handled the books. And when she left the company to start her family, she pretty much handled the books at our house. There was no deficit spending in our house. Uh, both of my parents uh, were Republicans, uh, though I think my mother was somewhat to the right of my father. And she was not happy, not one little bit, when I got a summer job during college at the Indiana Democratic State Central Committee. To compound this insult, five days a week, her car wasn't in the garage, it was in the Democratic State Committee parking lot. But it wasn't my fault. My father got me a job working for the Democrats, which was a hinge moment in my life. He met a man at a Presbyterian men's breakfast in downtown Indianapolis, and in Dateline parlance, what happened next would change my life forever. <laughs> I will let that thread dangle uh, just a moment and introduce another one. My parents, being fiscal conservatives, were very careful with a dollar. 
and equally careful with dimes, nickels, and pennies. And yet, the flow of change out the front door at our house was constant, a trickle of change, but steady. There was a veritable parade of boys at our poly doorstep, they were paper boys, delivering morning and afternoon, collecting that doorbell was ringing constantly. My parents took all three Indianapolis newspapers, the Star in the morning, the News in the afternoon, and also the more liberal Times. Um, and they read them. I, the vision of my father reading in bed. For some reason, he read these newspapers in, in bed at night or waiting for daughters to come home from dates, daddy sitting in a pool of light in his rocking chair reading the papers, a vivid memory. My mother was frighteningly well informed. Um, she hadn't gone to college either, but I remember one evening at dinner, I was in college, a political science major at IU, and mom drops the name Milton Friedman. Now, I, I sort of knew who he, an economist, I guess, but I could not have used his name in a sentence, much less an argument. My mother was formidable. Now, we weren't like the Kennedys. Don't get mom started on the Kennedys. When my mother talked politics, it was not an intellectual exercise. Politics were visceral with her. Politics mattered deeply. She would not have been happy that Janie came home and campaigned for Obama last fall, but never mind that. My father, it was the money. Money mattered deeply to daddy. Not spending money was recreational for my father. <laughs> this is a slightly off point, but he had a, a favorite brand of underwear. And when he decided it was time to replace them, it seems the company had been out of business for like 20 years. And yet, those three newspaper subscriptions, three of them, what was that about? My parents had a more than casual interest in current events. Uh, current events for them were more causal than casual. Their whole generation lived their lives between the headlines, and aren't we getting a taste of that now? My father's father uh, had a business in Morristown on Main Street. It went down with Wall Street after the crash in 29. My father's greetings from Uncle Sam came three weeks before Pearl Harbor. And again, when nobody was expecting another war, the one thereafter that was called that Korean mess in our house. It was just like the reservists being sent off to Iraq and leaving families behind. In September of 1950, my father was the second oldest man in boot camp. I was born two months later in 1950, and the 20th century was very, very good to me. I had a stake in current events too, but for me it was more like winning the sweepstakes. My parents subscribed to three newspapers. I subscribed to three news magazines, Time, Newsweek, and US News and World Report. This was the resource material that made 15-year-old Janie Pauley seem fluent in current events. Economics, guns or butter, foreign affairs, red China, a paper tiger, social controversy, guns, abortion. Well, buckle up, Lee. In his latest bestseller, uh, the Tipping Point author, Malcolm Gladwell, argues in Outlier that talent is overrated. He concludes that the secret of success is luck and timing. What he describes as unique opportunities and the steady accumulation of advantages. Now, my career hardly rises to Gladwellian proportions like a Bill Gates or Stephen Jobs, but the template fits. How you doing, Lee? Oh, he's taking notes. <laughs> oh, it's getting ugly tomorrow, I can see it. Earlier today, I visited my alma mater, Warren Central, on the far east side of Indianapolis. Warren Central uh, has been state speech and debate champs for three of the last four years. 
Uh, I went to help them celebrate, though I confess I was a little dismayed that all the new hardware was crowding the 40-year-old evidence of my heyday. I was a state champion in girls extemporaneous speaking in 1968. Now, back in the 60s, three governors of Hoosier Girl State came from Warren Central. I was the second of those three. A man named Harry Wilfong, is there another governor? Oh, hi, we'll talk later. Okay, a man named Harry Wilfong was our common denominator. He was our unique opportunity. He created the best speech and debate program in the state and what may have been one of the largest National Forensics League chapters in the country. For every weekend for three years, I boarded one of his team buses, we often filled two, to competitions all over central Indiana. This, he was my unique opportunity, and those competitions were a unique or a steady accumulation. You try to read my writing. <laughs> okay, those weekly speech and debate competitions were my steady accumulation. Uh, yes, that's right, steady accumulation of advantages. You know, I heard Barack Obama in Mexico the other day and he sounded tired. It was the first time I'd ever heard him stumble repeatedly. So give me a break here. <laughs> okay. Point was, <laughs> oh. thank you, thank you. My point was uh, that that was the luck and timing and that I got, as a result, better and better. Now to speak of timing. Uh, just for the sake of illustrating uh, Gladwell's argument, because I know most of you haven't read the book Outliers, and to be perfectly honest, I've only read the excerpts. But which of those three governors of Girl State from Warren Central in the 60s, each talented, each a favorite of Harry Wilfong, the speech coach, which of them had the best shot at the brass ring? Well, that would be the second one, that would be me, because I graduated from Indiana University in 1972. Not born too soon, not born too late, born just in time. 1972 was the year the FCC added two words to the affirmative action clause uh, pertaining to station licensing. Two words, and women. The building blocks of a career were falling into place. Right time, right place. Returning to that thread, I left dangling. The man my father met at that church breakfast in downtown Indianapolis was named Gordon St. Angelo. He was the chairman of the Indiana Democratic State Central Committee, and my father no doubt recognized his picture from the newspapers. Now, my father was a salesman, outgoing fellow, would never miss an opportunity to brag about his daughter and probably said something about my Janie's in politics, too, you know, governor of Girl State and all. <laughs> but my father was also fiscally conservative, deeply concerned about his investment in my college education. This political science thing, how was that ever going to lead to a job? Well, I got to tell you, it did on the spot. Gordon St. Angelo said, send her down to the office. 1970, it was a summer job. But after college, following a very brief and unsuccessful stint as an encyclopedia saleswoman, <laughs> I went back to Democratic State Committee. I did not know anything about the FCC or that and women thing. Uh, 1972 was a presidential election year, and I spent it at Democratic headquarters with mom's car until fate stopped by one day. Actually, it was Frank who stopped by one day, Frank Philippi. Frank Philippi had the political beat at uh, Channel 8, Wish TV in Indianapolis, and he was making his rounds at state committee, but he had news for me. He said they were hiring at Channel 8, looking for a reporter, specifically, a, this is a quote, a female type person. <laughs> My type exactly. And to be frank, I pretty much figured this interview was going to be a formality, what with 
my credentials and all. I mean, what more could this Lee Giles guy possibly be looking for? Well, two things, actually. Lee Giles had previously hired female-type persons, but they had degrees in journalism, and they had experience in journalism, which I did not, neither. And yet, for $125 a week, Lee hired me. Temporary probationary, 90 days. Third 30? <laughs> 30. Well, needless to say, neither Lee Giles nor Jane Foley ever expected me to be successful, much less this Hall of Fame, much less famous. I think, though, my parents were more surprised than either of us. After my debut on the Today Show, uh, a local newspaper reporter called home. My mother answered uh, the phone. How did she think Janie did? And this is what appeared in the newspaper. My mother said, fairly well. <laughs> I, I think she was absolutely right. Now, my daughter now has seen this, this, this tape probably more often than she likes. But, and she says, you were trying too hard, Mom. Duh. <laughs> I was 25. I won uh, the job in what I guess today we would call a reality show. The summer of 1976, it was an on-air tryout. There were uh, about five of us, six maybe, um, women five to 20 years older than I was, all with experience. I'm here skipping over one year I spent in Chicago, except to say that when my boss in Chicago poked his head in my office that day to ask, would I mind filling in on today, because he did not tell me that I was auditioning for a job. When he poked his head in the office that day, I was expecting to be fired. I was saved by audience research that summer, which I am told I won every category but one. Experience, duh. A woman um, well-known and worldly, some of you would remember the name Barbara Hauer, advised me to stop telling people how old I was, they're going to remember. Like that was a problem I really thought I'd be needing to worry about. Television looked so different then, and I looked so different from anything on television then. My colleagues, all men, uh, 10, 20, 40 years older. Men who could unselfconsciously make pronouncements such as, and that's the way it is. In those days, there was actually a premium on maturity and gravitas, qualities that I lacked in abundance. What did I have in abundance? Hair. <laughs> I had lots of hair. And I wore this hair and a certain self-deprecating humor, like armor. I was realistic about my deficiencies. And that's not an excess of humility talking. That's Tom Brokaw talking. Tom told the Washington Post, quote, Jane is realistic about her deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Plural. Well, some deficiencies kind of take care of themselves, like being too young. Well, as soon as I got over that, I started calling myself middle-aged in my early 40s, publicly, middle-aged. I got called on the carpet at NBC. An executive told me to knock it off, though I did not consider and do not consider middle age a deficiency. I was just being realistic. Last year, I clipped a David Brooks co column out of the paper in which he described Barack Obama as having a strain of something called pessimistic realism. That's what I've got! And all this time I thought it was being a Hoosier. <laughs> but self-awareness, thank you so much. <laughs> the best audience. God, I'm so glad you came. 
But self-awareness has its limits, and I am only fairly recently acquainted with a persona that I suspect my husband and my children and many of my colleagues have, have known quite well for a long time. I know her now as G.I. Jane. She does not wear self-deprecating humor. Oh no, she is armed and ready to shoot her mouth off. The other night, on the Upper East Side of New York, approaching Park Avenue in a cab, I see two grown men in a fight, serious fight. One guy is clearly on the defensive. Oh, no, wait a minute. New I love New York, and this doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> this is my only fight story. Okay, okay, but I see these two grown men in a, in a major fight, and then one guy is, is, is clearly getting the worst of it. He's, 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 he trips backwards, and he trips over a, a low uh, a, a guard fence around a tree. Now he's lying on his back like a turtle while this big, burly, very angry guy is pummeling the heck out of him. And about that time, the cab I'm in pulls alongside to stop for a red light. What do I do? I unbuckle my seatbelt, open the door, and call out, does someone here need help? Well, the guy on the bottom says, yes! And the guy on top stops throwing punches because he's kind of startled. And during this brief break in the action, perhaps inspired by my intervention, a half a dozen guys who had sort of been spectating halfway down the block and one very pretty, very worried looking girl take my cue, the light turns green, I let them take it from there. And the cabbie looks at me in his rearview mirror with respect. G.I. <laughs> Jane talks in what I call my mother voice. I have noticed that my mother voice can reduce grown men to little boys. They stop fighting and pay attention. My, my Ross, who is now 25, when he was four or five, was challenging my authority to enforce a bedtime. You're not a general. And I say, but even generals have mommies. <sighs> <laughs> Messing with his little head, I so regret that. Well, this is all by way of explanation of something that happened in the early 1990s when I was invited to speak at RTNDA, the Radio Television News Directors Association. Jane Pauley was invited, but G.I. Jane appeared at the podium. I had asked a colleague uh, what he thought I should talk about. Now, even then, the economy was in a recession, and he said rather glumly, something upbeat about why a kid would want to get in this business. And I gave this some thought, and I said, in 1991, it's better than banking. <laughs> well, after my joke, yeah, it is good. That was, yeah, yeah. After a little joke, I, I fired off a critique about the state of journalism education, which was pretty bold for one who didn't have one. I was a reader at the time of the annual survey of mass communication education and had been and remained somewhat troubled by a couple of disparities. First, that the young people in print journalism, by various objective markers, were more serious students than the ones who picked broadcasting. My own experience somewhat supported this. I graduated from IU with an A minus average in my major, political science. I got an A in the one course in the radio TV department that a non-major could get into. But in two electives I took in the journalism department, I could do no better than a B. They just seemed to have higher standards there at Ernie Pyle Hall. The other disparity was jobs. So many majors, so few jobs. Uh, last week, I spent some time advising a girl with a $160,000 degree in communications, and in this economy, that gives one pause. Well, to my surprise, people were listening and took me seriously. Uh, a guy named Reginald Stewart, really good-looking guy, really surprisingly attractive. For, where, I just, 
Yeah, okay. A guy named Reginald Stewart was then the president of SPJ. He took me for $25,000. He saw an opportunity to make Jane Pauley, or G.I. Jane, put her money where her mouth was. I was not a member of the Jane Pauley Task Force on Mass Communications. That reflected so well upon me. This was a serious committee. There were notables in broadcasting, academics, and one student under the direction of Lee Giles, who worked for a year to produce an important report with, of course, my name up front. Their conclusions I would describe as optimistic realism. It was a productive critique that had a positive impact. And I am sure that many, many people are grateful that I haven't meddled in academic affairs lately. <laughs> Different topic, several years ago I wrote a book. It was inspired by 30 some years of journalism, but it was not about journalism. That would have been presumptuous, it would also have been impossible. That I would w write a memoir at all is remarkable considering what passes here for a memory. How appropriate that the medium in which I have toiled is known as airwaves. <laughs> I was there. I can prove it on every format from film to beta to VHS and DVD, but I might as well have been taking notes on an Etch-a-Sketch pad for what I remember. I realized, uh, looking with some intimidation at my predecessors here at the, the Ubbin Lecture uh, uh, podium, um, a frightening group of people, and I had met or interviewed more than half of them. And I mentioned that in the sincere hope that there will be no follow-up questions. <laughs> I met Princess Diana. It was a fundraising event for her cause, mine removal. For me, it was another episode of mind removal. I remember my royal encounter like a fragment of silent film. We were talking. What are we saying? I don't remember. Poor Diana will be my ticket to immortality. I actually covered her funeral only three weeks after I met her from exactly the same spot in front of Buckingham Palace where I covered her wedding. My memory, I guess you could call it impressionistic, not journalistic so much. So me write a book, I would have said, you gotta be crazy. I was the last person I ever thought would write a book or be crazy. I wasn't actually crazy, it was a mood disorder. It's not a cognitive disorder. Hadn't it been said by a president of NBC News that Jane Pauley had the best mental health in the business? I was famously normal. Not that there was a lot of competition, certainly not at the network level, but... <laughs> but frankly, I thought I had the normal territory pretty locked up. 30 years. I was 30 days, 30 years, whatever. I was privileged to work at 30 Rock for 30 years with a view of that famous ice skating rink and the tree at Christmas. Did you know that Rockefeller Center is entirely built out of Indiana limestone? It's true. Get up really, really, really close, you can still see some little fish fossils. They spent all their lives and expected to spend eternity in the Bloomington area and suddenly they end up in New York City. <laughs> that must have been an adjustment. But it took those little fish fossils millions of years to get to New York City. I would like you to ponder this for just a moment. I went from weekend anchor of the big news at Channel 8 to co-host of the Today Show in about one. I can assure you that was quite an adjustment. But if I may boast, I handled it pretty well. I became accustomed to accolades like keeping her head on straight, having my feet on the ground, 
not letting it go to my head. Now granted, if you look at the early, early stuff, I sort of sound like a cross between Princess Grace and Barbara Walters. But who at 25 has found their own voice? The Scottish poet Robert Burns, would that God the gift would give us to see ourselves as others see us. But alas, unless you've seen your own audience research, that's practically impossible. But I have. <laughs> and I can tell you that it's been pretty consistent over these 30 years. Authenticity and normal, my things. Though in my experience, Midwestern and normal are pretty much used interchangeably elsewhere. Still, it took me by surprise one morning, not, not too long ago, to come across this in the New York Times. Morning show hosts are supposed to seem normal. That's the quality that got Jane Pauley her job on today in 1976. This assertion was made without irony, though I suspected the reporter had read my book, Skywriting, A Life Out of the Blue, in which I described the morning I ceased to be famously normal. It was a Monday, Coincidentally, the very first day of a six-week sabbatical from NBC. My calendar was packed with meetings. I planned to work on a book. I was chatting with a doctor. I filled an hour with enthusiasm and big plans. And at last he said, Jane, you seem to be racing. And he asked, did I know about bipolar disorder? Now, as a generalist and a journalist, I know a little bit about a lot of things. And I knew that bipolar was once more commonly called manic depression. I knew about Ted Turner. I knew it wasn't good news. But I knew it was news. It was news that I had it. And I recognized a good story. I recognized on day one even though I was sick, that it was a story with tremendous redeeming potential, and who better to tell it than myself. I knew I would have to get well first, of course, and I was very fortunate that certain snarky tabloid journalists didn't get hold of the story first. I was a lot luckier than a certain mega pop star who was hospitalized that same summer. She got the usual celebrity treatment from our fellow journalists at the New York Post, a one-word headline, wacko. I was lucky to recover in private. That six-week sabbatical segued quietly into a six-month leave of absence, and I returned to work in the fall on a Monday. It was the 10th of September. The next day was September 11th which kind of put everything in perspective, didn't it? I didn't write that book for another three years. I know a lot more about mental illness now than when I wrote a skywriting. For instance, that giving support is as therapeutic as getting it. There is research on that, and I can personally attest to its validity. Being able to tell my story has been a blessing for me, and I hope it has helped move the conversation about mental illness in a direction it was already rapidly moving toward, toward knowledge and insight. Mental illness is a treatable illness, and mental illness is a medical illness. Call that optimistic realism. I don't intend to make a career out of mental health advocacy. I'm still a journalist, uh, not working. Uh, I hope to find new ways uh, to tell stories. But I don't think I ever told or will ever tell a story more important than the one I told about myself. Summing up here, my reputation for being normal had to be tweaked a bit. But that authenticity part, that's held up pretty well. In fact, I think you might even call it my claim to fame. Thank you.
Well, uh, to, to quote your mother, you did fairly well. Um, we, we have uh, time for a, a, a few questions, and we have microphones on both sides, so I'd invite people to come up and, and give Jane Pauley some questions. Thank you. Uh, while you're waiting to uh, warm up your, your hands to ask questions, I have to tell you, my daughter um, uh, flew out to Indiana uh, from New York and uh, uh, was on standby with another guy that got on the plane, and they, they were lucky to get the two back seats, and it turned out your brand new president uh, was her seatmate on a flight from New York. She, I picked her up at the airport in Indianapolis. She just, na 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 the coolest dude in the world. I mean, like, uh, uh, yeah. And I mean, she doesn't get excited like that, you know. She's she's pretty pretty laid back cookie, but very very impressed. And I'm fairly impressed myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, we're committed to questions, so. Um, um, I, oh, hello, I didn't see microphones. Hi there. Hi, um, my name is Lori, and I'm a student at IU, a graduate student, and I'm doing research in press coverage of the Obama campaign, mm -hmm. and so I was interested in knowing what kind of reaction you've gotten as a journalist who became a political activist yeah. uh, from other journalists. Um, for one thing, it was really under the radar. Uh, you know, people really didn't know I was here. Um, and I, I, I thought about that, but I hadn't worked for, haven't worked for NBC News in six years. And um, while I was very cognizant of the fact that once a journalist, and particularly one that I think, I flatter myself, I had a, 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 a good reputation for being trustworthy. Um, so it was, I, I thought seriously before I did it, and I, I sent an email, and, and I'm a Hoosier, so the, the idea that, that I would, you know, well, can I help the campaign in Indiana because of my being so famous and all, is just not the way people think, and I don't. So I sent an email to the Indiana Democratic State Central Committee, um, and the top of the line said, can Jane Pauley help? Obama in Indiana. And then the body of the email, you know, said, you may not remember I used to work for NBC and, <laughs> and, um, and before that I was at the Indiana State, I worked at State, anyway. So, and I was so self-conscious about it and I get this email back fairly quickly and in capital letters it said, yes, she can. <laughs> mm -hmm. No. I mean, I watched election night. I mean, in Indiana, went you know went blue, but at two in the morning and just barely. So, um, um, as a not non-working journalist, um, as a political science major, uh, from a family where politics and current events really weren't news, it was life. I mean, I think that's one of the differences between, you know, some journalists growing up uh, in, in families of journalists, you know, it's the news, it's about getting the story. And, and, and a difference between me, we were talking earlier with someone, the difference between me and Judy Woodruff, who is a journalist to the bone core, you know, get the story. With me, it was more find the story, and I, and I think my, you know, my essential nature, very objective. Um, my husband once explained at dinner, you remember the Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan episode? Okay. So the kids, this is a long time ago, so my kids were littler. And, you know, do you think she did it? You know, Tanya Harding whack, you know, do you think she did it? And Gary said to the kids, you know, sure as hell she did it, but your mom won't say so because she's too objective. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, had I been uh, had had I been working, I would not have approved of it. And and and, and frankly, a critique of of, uh, of 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 the industry. I I, I think there's been uh, some a termite problem. We have undermined uh, our ourselves. And you know, it depends on which side of the audience you're on. You know, they're biased. You know, you're standing like this. You know, they're biased. You know. Well, there's there there is bias, but once uh, the pundits took over, there's a new book. I read books about neuroscience now that I have a more interested in brain things. Um, there's a book, a really interesting new one called How We Decide. And there's a page in it. You rip it out, blow it up, and frame it about pundits. There's research that shows that that pundits, on average, get it wrong 
beyond chance. That, and there's a reason for this. And that the reason for this is these are people who, whose decision-making mechanism um, knows the answer to the question and then goes to find the evidence. And they don't do this because they're bad people. They do this because it's human nature and that they do this anyway. So the pundits, according to research, that you can trust the least are the ones who are most certain. They are the ones who are most completely wrong. And, you know, to a degree, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the media has, is, you know, punditry is, is kind of what it is. And um, it, it wasn't that way when, you know, when I started, though my mother never trusted the media, not, certainly not when I was on it, because, you know, I'd been contaminated by the Democrats. But um, I didn't realize this. The, you know, the Indianapolis Star and the Pulliam family is so important to journalism in Indiana and to SPJ. And, um, uh, but it, nonetheless, it, it, known to be conservative, you go run around uh, the, the Indiana in the old days, you would see mailboxes outside farmhouses, you know, it would be the, the court and Democrat or the, you know, I mean, people, you know, wore their, their politics, even in the journalism, was right on the headline of the paper they, they took. So th this is, you know, not all that new. But the Pulliam papers carried Doonesbury from the first year. There was one year, Gary said, and this is, 37 years. And, and, you know, Gary was a wild-eyed, you know, radical in terms of, you know, comics pages. I mean, you know, I, I didn't read it, actually. I read Nancy. And, um, but uh, I didn't read Doonesbury. Um, I had to, Google didn't exist, but I had to look it up when I started dating him. But, but the Pulliam family ran Doonesbury from the first year it was available. Um, it was pulled uh, for a period of time, briefly, uh, but put back in uh, before a year was out and has run in the Indianapolis Star uh, ever since. Um, that's healthy. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Oh. Hi. I, I was going to ask a, a similar question. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, political activism is very opposite of objective journalism. We wouldn't expect a working journalist to be politically active. Mm -hmm. But do you think the objective political reporting has become too passive? Oh, I don't, I couldn't cite examples of, of, of passivity. I think uh, sometimes it's cowed by a perception of how it will go down. Um, and, uh, and that's a real, a real fear. But I don't know, I'm not a student of, 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 of journalism as a reporter or, or in the history of journalism. But I do know that in the history of our country, it's been so much worse. So much worse. Um, it, reading about Lincoln, uh, the the head of the uh, Republican Party uh, that assumed that Seward would get the the nomination when Abraham Lincoln got the nomination by surprise instead. Uh, the head of the party was a, a major newspaper publisher in in, in Albany, New York. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson and, you know, and Madison and Alexander Hamilton used to t say terrible things about each other, lies under pseudonyms um, in, you know, in broadsheets. So as bad as it is, it's been a lot worse, but it's better than it is anywhere else. Hi. Um, I'm curious about what you see as the division or the relationship between entertainment and news, you know, particularly from your experience in cable TV, which I know has been critiqued as more entertainment mm -hmm. than news. Um, how much do you think people need to be entertained to get engaged in the news, and how much do you have to yeah. step back and make Well, I've, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm smug and I hate that, but I, you know, I never, I didn't work, in, the only work I did in cable TV was a, a, one of the favorite programs that I ever was associated with was called Time and Again. And in the beginning of the first couple of years of time and again, it was a, a retrospective current event show. So it was an opportunity, frankly, for NBC to recycle, you know, you know, material. So it was a commercial impulse. But, but we would tell, you know, half-hour stories. We would take you to a polit particular political convention, and it was and show you how it was covered. 
um, you know, showing John Chancellor being, you know, escorted by police off the floor at the, the, the Chicago uh, Democratic Convention, you know, the year of the whole world is watching and all. It was a wonderful show, and it, it, I love the tagline. I used to get to say, and we're history. And now, and now I am history. But then the show, um, it's true. But then the show, I stopped doing the show, and, and the show evolved into celebrities. It was totally, you know, that my immortality, the wedding, the wedding, the wedding, the funeral, the wedding, the funeral, the, you know, the, um, it totally became a, a celebrity uh, show, and, and, uh, but it was more successful, and less news and more successful. Um, a dateline, you know, how, what, how, you know, it would change her life forever. What she didn't know would, you know, I mean, and there were all these storytelling flourishes, but you know, once again, even in, you know, with straight old time journalism, um, you know, telling a story means keeping your interest. You know, that's why you, you put, you know, you don't bury your lead. The reason you do that is because you want the reader to stay with you all the way, you know, through the story. But, um, you know, I'm going to say one more thing because I can kind of ramble and, Oh, uh, the man who gave me the job on the Today Show uh, was a man named Dick Wald, and he had been at NBC News uh, for some years, later went, spent a lot of his career at ABC. He was the first president of a network news organization that accidentally finished the year with more money than he started with. And before that, the news organizations were um, you know, not expected to make a profit. They were what, you know, made, you know, the, the, the Tiffany Network was, CBS News was what made it the Tiffany Network. But the year he made a profit, suddenly, you know, television became a, a commercial enterprise. And now, I mean, consider what's happening to newspapers. And my husband is a, a, a cartoonist and he's already, he's losing papers. The newspaper, uh, you know, implosion that, that he always thought might happen is happening so quickly. And it's because commercial uh, newspapers are commercially supported and if the advertising dollars aren't there, um, you know, subscription sales don't cover the costs. So, you know, we, you know, commercial, we're not, we don't have the BBC, you know, we don't have a state supported newspaper nor would we want one. Um, so, you know, you tip one way or, or, or the other. I think though, I personally think, though nobody but you have asked me, and you didn't ask me this, but um, that one way, you know, the news media can get its niche back is to get straight again. Uh, because, you know, when you're competing with entertainment programs, well, the entertainment programs are probably going to do better. So if you do what they're not doing, reliably and well, um, I mean, I depend on the news hour on PBS. Um, I pray that Jim Lehrer lives forever. Um, because, you know, what they do is, is, is journalism and broadcast journalism, and it's, in my opinion, the absolute best, and I absolutely depend on it. Um, though I gotta say, the network shows are, to me, I watch them, but they're optional. The news hour is not optional. Hello, Dr. Polly. My name is <laughs> Abigail Oliver, and I'm a senior here at DePauw. My father still boasts to this day that he received his degree with Jane Polly in 1978. So that's always been fun. <laughs> yeah, so I'm older than her father. <laughs> yes, I see. That would make me, let's figure this out. <laughs> Your father was in kindergarten when I was in the sixth grade. Only by six years. Yeah. Uh, that's anyway, it. but you're lovely. And Thank he did you. A, he did a great job. You must be very proud. Thank you. Do you have a job next year? Um, not yet, but I'm hoping to get into sports broadcasting. Sports so. broadcasting? Yes. Yeah. So if you have any contacts, feel free to. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Would you, re would you repeat your name? Yeah, I can give you my email address no, and phone I mean for number them. as well. You never know. Abigail Oliver, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question isn't quite as intellectual, but I wanted to know the most shocking answer you've ever gotten from a question when you've been doing an interview. 
that you were not expecting at all. I already told you I have a memory like Swiss cheese. <laughs> you know, maybe if, you're, if you don't get a job this summer, you can come to New York, look at my DVDs, and find the answer to that we question. Answer that question. <laughs> you know, I swear, I mean, I live, I've, I, I'm the kind of person I live one step into the, the future. I literally, I mean, I don't have a college education. I got, someone sent me a letter that they found and purchased at a flea market one of my college notebooks. <laughs> I have none. I have no evidence of an education. I wondered why they didn't offer to send it to me. <laughs> anyway, I don't have a good answer to that. that I, I wish I could reward that very good question. What's the best thing on your resume, just in case someone's listening? <laughs> Well, I've done lots of internships with sports media, and I've also have a, uh, had a lot of public relations experience, which helps a lot in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've also worked um, for the Royals Radio Network, and this is not So my son Tommy is graduating this year, too. Oh, yeah. And he's not specifically interested in sports broadcasting, but sports something. And uh, you look a lot like his girlfriend, only... <laughs> You know, if that doesn't work out. There's always that option. Yeah. Could do that. Yeah. I think, you're, I think interesting things will happen to you, Abigail. Thank you. I yeah. hope so. Would you give your father my, my, my best? Absolutely. I sure will. I will. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, um, I drove over here from Bloomington uh, to see you tonight. Oh, thank and, you. Um, I was wondering if you're familiar with Don Johnson, the IU law professor and soccer mom, <laughs> Sunday school teacher that President Obama has nominated for his, um, to head his um, Office of Legal Counsel. Um, he would like for her to be our lawyer um, for the country and um, she's been... Um, she's Don been, what? Uh, Dawn Johnson, yeah, okay. uh, with an S E N. Yeah. Um, she's she's been under attack quite a bit, and um, there's a threatened filibuster against her nomination. So I just wondered if you were familiar with her. I'm her. not, but I have to tell you, I was talking about this at dinner. Uh, coming from Indiana, and uh, I have for many, many, many years have antenna that are very alert to when Indiana is in the news. Um, oh gosh, in the beginning, there was one year when there was a spate of terrible crimes, you know, like mass murders and things. And I remember once Brokaw turning to me and says, what's in the water? Um, but lately, and I'm not talking about the economy, because Indiana's been in the news for the economy, and I was up in Elkhart, and I know, you know, I know. But that said, Every day I read my, have my coffee in, in, in my New York Times in front of me, and as often as not, some expert from Indiana is in the article I'm reading. And you know, sometimes on the next page, it's another expert from Indiana. It is, uh, or some, some new business, some new technology that's being uh, developed in Indiana. Some, it's just, something's happening uh, here that is, is, is very dynamic. And I, I, I think the fact that um, I understand um, uh, President's nominated a, a, his first judgeship uh, was a, a Hoosier. Uh, nominee, um, Indiana is, is 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 way on the map. I think the days of the the flyover thing, um, you know, it's, it's something's going on. I, I just I get real proud now. And yeah, I'm yeah I'm Hoosier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got those genes. Anyway, I don't know that, but I will. I'll, but th thank you. Um, as a extemporaneous speaker, I, as a teenager, I would have known that. I would have if that had been on the test, I would have known it. Hello, Dr. Polly. I'm Annie Tierney, and I am a junior at DePauw. And I would like to know, I'm interested in broadcast journalism for um, the future, and I would like to know what you think of the field and the positives and n the negatives. And because of all the media convergence like occurring and all, everything going digital, do you think like television news is going to be? Well, you, you know what? You're so lucky because you're, you are young, and something nobody knows what the business model is anymore. Um, and that's not great news for people maybe in the middle or near the end of their uh, careers, uh, but for young people. I remember m 
meeting Sylvester Weaver, who was the man who, he did two important things. He's credited with uh, creating the commercial pod. You know, when your television pro program stops and now you gotta watch a bunch of commercials. Before Sylvester Weaver, it was, uh, the news was the uh, Camel News Caravan, was sponsored by Camel Cigarettes. But, but a, a company would, would, you know, Palmolive brings you, or, you know, Dinah Shore with the Chevy or whatever. Um, Sylvester Weaver invented the commercial pod and he also created the Today Show. And he, was, uh, uh, he also was the father of, um, of um, Sigourney Weaver, the actress. Um, but I, I heard him speak once, and he was riveting, talking about the early days. And I remember thinking how great it would have been to have been at the beginning when, the, when visionaries were inventing uh, the, you know, the industry. We're there again. New things are happening. The old model is not going to, you know, be there. But you know, you are at the dawn of something. Um, so all I can advise you is to, you're you're at DePaul, so you're getting a really good and expensive education. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, it, but just be really serious about about your education, your your knowledge, uh, because. When you leave here and you're looking for a job in broadcasting journalism or whatever it is, uh, you know the thing that, that is you can't miss with is being smart and uh, literate. Um, so, you know, bear down, focus on on your studies, on your grades, and um, and then you'll be be ready. You know, when you and other people like you invent the future of which I will not be a part, because I'm history. Hello. Jane. Yes. Uh, one of the things a reporter must do when he goes out to cover a story is to make sure he has the, the, the essence of a presentation. I'm not saying that I think that you said just one thing tonight. You said many things, and by the way, I'm going to end by complimenting you. But I am sort of an offender. And that is because I wanted to check my notes oh, no. as to what you said that the way for media to get back is to get straight. Am I quoting you correctly? I don't know. <laughs> Does that sound about right? Okay, okay. My compliment to you. I have attended the University of Missouri School of Journalism Centennial last September. And I've now attended the Society of Professional Journalists Centennial in April of 2009. What is your At, name? My name is John Piron. And you are? Philadelphia. Oh, really? Yeah. And one of the things that I looked for at both Centennials was some hard-charging commentator talk about the need to get straight. You're the first person to have said that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> Thank you.